in my basement, it's covered in PBR parts. You pull into my garage, it's covered in PBR parts. For a month, we had engines in there. Um, my wife never has complained, never once said anything. Every once in a while she says, can you put your phone down for a few minutes and just kind of be here in the moment with us? And I respect that. I actually bought this boat off of eBay. I was looking for a, a boat and I was going through eBay and it said on, on the uh, thing, it said a Mark II Vietnam Air PBR. I said, no, that can't be. That's what I was on. So I like to see history preserved. And our country wants to eradicate the history of the Vietnam War by doing away with all this hardware. Some people look at it, I think, as this shameful thing, while others of us look at it in pride. I look at the boat, aesthetically it's not as, I, I find this boat to just look sexy. It's a sexy war boat. The PBR is a high-speed fiberglass boat, drawing only 18 inches of water with no propellers or other hull protrusions. It is powered at speeds up to 25 knots by water jet pumps, which not only drive the boat, but also steer it. I know when, when you're in Vietnam, and we'd push both the throttles forward. We'd lose men off the, the back of the boat and had to go pick them back up because they weren't expecting that they weren't holding on to anything and they'd just go out the back. <laughs> this boat was so well thought out that it served up and through desert storms. Some guys were serving on these up until like 1998. So you're looking from 1968 to 1998, 30 years of service the PBR Mark II saw with very little changes. Vietnam, if you look at it like a banana, and you cut that banana in half, you have North Vietnam and South Vietnam. Take the bottom half of the banana, cut it into four sections. You have I core, two core, three core, four core. Well, three of the four cores are heavy waterways. All along the 1,500 miles of South Vietnam's coastline and in the endless waterways of the Mekong River Delta, nine million acres of fertile wet rice paddies and farmlands, the only practical means of transportation for farmer and businessman, fisherman and tourist, government loyalist and Viet Cong is by water. Uncontrolled, this normal activity provides the VC with a continuing opportunity for smuggling and infiltration. It is clear to American naval observers early in the war that an essential step in denying this most populous area of South Vietnam to the Viet Cong would be the development of patrol craft suited to the task of controlling these lanes of transportation and communication. So the Navy became what was the most dynamic time in history and created the Brown Water Navy. They took boats like this they took World War II heavy boats, modified them, and then brought the fight to the enemy, because that's what we do in American military. We improvise, adapt, and overcome. I was an engineer in the United States Navy for four years. I arrived very early, I think, February or late, no, late February of 70, and I come home February of 71. On the back of the boat was my position. I had a mortar, a 60 millimeter mortar, and then an M60 on top of the machine gun. We got into a big fight one night, and the next morning when we got the boat back to our base, I had about eight holes through my mufflers in one side, out the other. You don't hear them because the boat is fiberglass, and there's so much going on you're not going to hear. I got a little excited, and all I did was beach the boat, patch up the holes, paint them green, and away you go. That one got, that one got me fairly excited. We caught a Viet Cong, and we got him on the back of our boat, and uh, I took a picture of him. He's sitting right back here, where he's on this side, and he's like this. And one of the guys said, whose turn? It was mine. So I shot him in the head and threw him overboard. That was it. Well, we rarely captured him. We, didn't, we never let that, typically wouldn't let that happen. We just happened to catch this guy just by accident. So, my job that day. I regret that. I've dealt with it in PTSD classes. 
Um, it would have been me, it would have been one of the other guys. That's not how I was thinking at that moment, but uh, looking back after all these years, it's my worst haunt, is that we could have taken them back. Oh, you know, or I could have said to them, one of the guys, I don't want to do it. And they, nobody would have cared if I did it or not. But I did, it's my job. I'm not looking for forgiveness for what I did. I don't want to be forgiven. I am looking for, and I've dealt really well in my classes with what I did was okay at that time. It's okay. You know, we'll deal with it. That was one of my reasons for uh, trying to find a boat because ever since I was in Vietnam, I said, well, I'd like to restore one and use it for helping Vietnam veterans. You know, the water therapy, it's sort of like a horse therapy or dog therapy or something like that for, for us. So that's why I started this project. One day I was talking with one of my best friends. We were uh, smoking cigars, working on wood, you know, doing manly stuff. And I mentioned to him I thought it'd be cool to get a boat specific to Vietnam to make it available to the community and veterans often. And he just told me, why not? Uh, why not try? So I got a hold of a list of all the PBRs. I went down the list and tried to, I called everyone I could call or emailed. And most people laughed at me. And most people said, yeah, you can have my PBR for $250,000. And John McClure was the only one who said, I think we can maybe make something happen. I called the guy up then, I said, how much would you take for the boat? And he told me, I said, well, I can't afford that. I said, would you take any less for a, a Navy veteran and one that was actually on boats in Vietnam? And She's in rough shape. She has not seen a good coat of paint in I don't know how long. The engines were sitting on two by fours and they had broken. Those things are 2,000 pounds a piece. They're laying in the engine compartment, oil is everywhere. The deck that you're standing on, you can see through parts of it because it's just been faded and worn. There was no armor. There was no armor on the front. There was no paint. There was no frame. Canopy wasn't up. None of this was here. It literally was the hull in this. I'd been trying to get it restored and Robert Boyer came along and he's really helped out in that. He's uh, started the Black Sheep, Operation Black Sheep organization, got it incorporated and got the 501c3 for it. So it's been moving. 2300 in the dark of the moon and the crossing attempts tonight will probably occur sometime between 2300 and 0300. I want one boat positioned in here all the time. The other boat will patrol through the complete area. It's a four man crew. You have an after gunner, a forward gunner, a boat captain, and uh, a guy here on the engine covers. And I normally rotated around here. Our normal patrols was like 18 hours. You leave the Navy base or you're operating off an LST like this ship out here. Uh, we uh, actually buried them that during the night. And next morning we get up and go get on our boats and take off for our patrol areas. Well, we would get intelligence reports about VC crossings, and we were to interdict and stop the uh, flow of contraband into South Vietnam. We also, during the daytime, on your daytime patrols, would stop sandpans and junks and search them for contraband and make sure they had their ID cards and weren't carrying any weapons. Most of the uh, firefights occurred during nighttime, you know. I'll be the patrol officer, Stingray 1. Cover boat will be Stingray 17. We have friendly ambushes located tonight here and here. When we were patrolling, we called them one-shot Charlies. They'd come up by the bunkers along the canals and the rivers, take one shot at you with a B-40 and go back down. So you could put everything in you had on them and it wouldn't affect them because they were down in the bunkers underneath the ground. The river section I was in, 541, was the first uh, river patrol section to patrol in Vietnam. Uh, I got there in June of 67, and so probably about, yeah, 20 days later, I'm in a hospital. 
the PBRs in Vietnam had, uh, it's like an overall casualty rate of 85% wounded or killed. Well, these guys are in a body of water. There's nowhere to run. The only place you can run and hide is on this boat. When I was in Afghanistan, I could find a boulder, a rock, a ditch, an armored vehicle. They had none of that. So these guys are out in the water, completely exposed, and then you got to return fire. And these guys went into places that you could barely fit the boat. So a guy could walk up and gun you down. And these guys took this boat there. That's awesome. Every guy I've met, I don't know, I don't know the statistics as far as that, but I have met a dozen guys who all stood, they were can they say well, I was a canopy gunner. And they say I was a canopy gunner, that means they stood on the canopy and they manned an M60. Every single guy I've met that had that was a recipient of the Purple Heart. I have not met one that's like, oh yeah, I served up there and never got shot. Like, it, it amazes me. And, and at the time, if I told you in modern combat you were going to do that, I would be in so much trouble. Some mom and dad would call home to the States. They'd be yelling up and down at us. I'd probably lose a stripe over it. And those guys did it without hesitation. They were afraid of the boats because they could pick on us, but they couldn't fight us. I mean, they could throw the shots or throw the rocket, but then they either had to hide or run because they couldn't take us on. And we tried to be just a little smarter than they were, where we were. We also did a lot with Navy SEALs, taking the SEALs out into remote areas and letting them do their job, which a lot of people don't quite know what we did with Navy SEALs. They would capture, say, village officials that were sympathizing with the Viet Cong or protecting them. The SEALs depended on us to get them in and out fast, quietly. We took them up into Cambodia and dropped them off it was about 200 in the morning, 0200, and uh, they said pick them up in a couple hours. So we went back, picked them up, and I noticed this one Navy SEAL had a burlap bag over his shoulder and something was moving in that bag. And I said, oh, you found a VC, huh? He said, no, it's a VC pig. We took it back to the Naval base and had a roasted pig that day. Uh, to me, it was great because we got some good food and good camaraderie with the SEALs and uh, the Navy people. We just, you know, had a good tight bond closeness there. I just kind of got on Facebook in the last th three, four years, and I stumbled across something about some guy in Muskegon has got a PBR. I think, oh yeah, the, the guy's on uh, Facebook. He's uh, sheep something or other, I, I don't know, what, was a PBR sheep guy or not. Well, then I found out it's Operation Black Sheep. When we started this out, I looked around at different names and I really felt like it applied to the way that our country treated its veterans, that they're the black sheep of the community, that they were, were this odd man out, you know, and for post-Vietnam, you were a potential John Rambo, you were a bomb waiting to go off. And people still look at us and treat us that way, sometimes for the best, sometimes for the worst. And uh, I just found it suiting that, you know, once you go to war, you come back, you're going to be different in some form or another. And sometimes you're proud to stand out from the flock, but some days it's not always the best thing. I was just starting PTSD therapy at uh, Grand Rapids VA and I wasn't quite sure what I would do with it. I had to, I had to see the boat first. And then, but it was, it was a good thing for me, very good thing. I have been working on it since about September 1st of last year. I really don't remember a whole lot about the engines and stuff like that, but just working on the boat and trying to remember things and being with everybody and trying to figure out what part goes here and how big we should cut the hole and where to move it. Uh, it is just, it's fantastic trying to figure all that stuff out. I didn't even know we had boats in the United States. I thought they were all left in Vietnam. But this boat was fast. It could turn on a dime, stop on a dime. It was just an amazing piece of work that we could cruise on top of the water. Uh, we could skip banks between rice paddies and keep on going. The only thing that would stop us would be a rope or a plastic bag to get sucked into the pumps. Other than that, it was pretty much, in my opinion, invincible. 
She served in what was called Special Boat Unit 11, SBU 11 out of Mare Island, California. There's a couple that, couple veterans in Michigan that served on her. They called her 331 is what they did. Most boats never came home from Vietnam. We turned them almost all over to the South Vietnamese. So most boats like 7331 were in the Special Boat Unit stateside. And then what's unique about this boat is in 1973, so she was the seven, built in 73, 1733, and then she was the 31 boat built of that year. So that gives that number of, of what she is. So there's a 7330, uh, there's a 7333, so on and so forth. But 7334 is the only one that I know that's still out there today. Once you meet Robert and his enthusiasm, you're hooked. I mean, he's, he's the man. Served in Afghanistan, two tours, 05 to 06, 07 to 08, with the 173rd Airborne Brigade. Born and raised in Muskegon, Michigan. MCC graduate and Grand Valley graduate. And then wanted to kind of change the pace of things. So, started this. I never thought I could make it to community college. I never thought I could get a degree. I never thought I could do a lot of things. But when I left the Army, I clearly struggled with education. I was ignorant to many things. Andrew and I had became friends and over the years him and I have been able to over adapt to a lot of stuff and when I started this Andrew wanted to be part of it and Andrew came to me one day after a semester and we went and had a beer to relax and he says I want to be part of this whole process and I don't want to just hang out I want to be bigger than that so me needing I to do something bigger than just be another person in the world. Yes, he, so Andrew is our first mate technically, and he's my first mate, and we are working together and building this boat together, as well as when time comes, working on staffing it and properly taking it out, right? Right. And a big part of what makes it is, is he's been there through everything and supportive, and I feel like if I can keep him, you know, by my side, and I don't lose him along the way, then I'm doing well. At Grant had, Grant, General Grant had a Sherman, Sherman yeah. and you had me. Yeah, that's right. You know, I called him and asked him if he would care if I'd come over here. And he goes, well, heck no, we want people to come over here, and especially you PBR guys, because this is why we're doing it. I mean, you can't say he's doing it for the Army, because, they, well, I guess the Army does have it now, and they had a small river section, but primarily the Navy had this, and he's a, I don't know how old he is, but, to me, he's a young pup, and it's like, I just can't think of enough. You know, it just almost brings tears to my eyes right now. Thanks to Robert, we've been able to get this boat to where it is right now, and we're probably only a couple months from putting it in the water. Uh, but Robert's been very meticulous on this and making sure everything is done right, making it original, like we had it in Vietnam. And that's what I enjoy about it. It's close to the real deal. It's as real as, as, as we can get. If the guns were working, she'd be it. We're the only ones with the spotlight and the white star that's up on top. And the reason I had him put the star on is in Vietnam, we were on patrol one day and were taken under fire by some friendlies and they didn't know we were U.S. So we put the white star on to, to let them know that aircraft flying over would see us as American. Our engines were redone in Ohio. Almost everything else has come from Muskegon or to Grand Rapids. A lot of our steel and armor is here from Muskegon and a company in Grand Rapids, Constructive Sheet Metal, keeps sending us stuff. Federal Mogul, a 12 billion dollar company and they call me up and they say any parts you need if we make them you got it just let us know get us that list so if you put a value to man hours all the volunteer hours um, I'd say we're probably in about a seventy thousand dollar mark it's, it's tremendous I mean it, it gives me chills every time I come and look at it I live in Bay City Michigan and I was a uh, time in Vietnam I was an E3 or, and then promoted to E4 which is petty officer third class. We were going down the uh, the Longtow River, which is the main shipping channel river, and then we went down the uh, Dong Tron River, and we went maybe three, four miles. It's like a nice day going down the Muskegon River. It was just sunny and nice temperatures. 
I'm looking forward and all of a sudden the searchlight on the 50 just explodes in my face and I looked to my right and I could see the rocket that's about this long and it lands in the water, it never exploded. And of course the natural thing, at least for me, is I duck down like what the hell is going on, you know? Over the 50 years that this has happened, as you think about it, and it seems like you were down there an hour, but it was probably down there two seconds, three seconds. So I popped back up to turn the guns, and I had the brake still on the turret. It wouldn't turn, so I had to unlock it. And I turned the, the guns towards where the firing was coming from and started shooting. And then on the port side, the boat got hit with another rocket, which went inside of the area. It was this hollow down here, and shrapnel went all the way around in there, and I got wounded in the legs. And then. Um, a couple seconds later, this uh, radar dome, which is behind me, was uh, struck by a rocket and blew, blew me down into the gun turret. Well, when I came back from the hospital, I went down and looked at the boat. It was still, it was all fixed up, except it didn't ha have the uh, radar dome on it. It hadn't received one yet. And the flag was still on there, and it was not a new flag. I mean, there, all the, everything was painted and shiny like this boat is getting. And so I went back and talked to my commanding officer. I said, I was down looking at the boat. I said, the flag's on there. I said, would you care if, if I took that flag as long as nobody else wants it? He says, yeah, go ahead, take it if you want it. So I had it for 49 years last year. I, uh, I had it framed up. The picture of all four of us uh, with our purple hearts. Where Dave Kelly was sitting, standing, the guys that were there, if you can replicate that in any way that makes them smile or have a happy memory, because why they were serving in Vietnam, war sucks and you have bad days, but you have some of the best days of your life and some of the worst days. I don't want to relive the worst days for these guys, but many of them sitting in a place and seeing it and hearing the engines, it brings back some of the best days of their lives. So why not give that to them, you know? and. I, it amazed me that there was, there's 33 of these boats out there, so it's not that rare, but I can't believe nobody thought like this should be done for everybody, to be available to everybody. Yeah, we hope to be berthed on the outboard side of the LST. Uh, there where the gangplank is, it goes into the hold there. But we actually, uh, the first river division that I served on in Vietnam, we actually served off the Hunterton County, which was an LST. Historically in Vietnam, they were marred up to LSTs. LSTs back in Vietnam were named after counties, USS Garrett County. Well, there's only two LSTs in the entire US, one in Ohio, one in Muskegon, and if these boats historically docked up to it, it only makes sense to be there with them. That's a memory for a lot of those guys. So once again, you come to this museum, beautiful place in Muskegon, the boat's sitting there, you pay a small fee, you go for a ride. You know, we had a two-boat patrol in Vietnam, a lead boat and a cover boat. And I said, I'd like to continue that here, and maybe we can have our own little patrol someday on Lake Michigan. This boat will be accessible five days a week. And then every month, we'll have calendar days for free for veterans. And then if a veteran lets us know ahead of time and we can prepare for it, they can come in ones and twos and ride for free during the week even. It's that simple. And I get this phone call from this guy who says, I'm, you're gonna have PBR on your boat, right? And I said, I, I don't have a liquor license, so no. He says, well, Paps Blue Ribbon is the unofficial beer of the Brown Water Navy. If you were around it, that's what you're drinking. And he tells me a story about how he's in the back aft gunner, and he'd come forward and they kept the cooler right where the captain's piloting the boat. And they had a, a little, like, wooden board on the back of the helm with a list of like drinks like dry martini, whiskey on the rocks, uh, you know, uh, whatever it was you order. And he said the captain would turn around and like listen, like yes, yep, if you want it, you shake and stir and you'd finish whatever it was you're ordering, he'd reach down and pop the top off a of PBR and hand it to you. And you just, guys chuckled. I, loved, I liked the story, I'm like, that's cool. We spent a lot of time together, and I never met the man until last year, but I now consider him one of my good friends. He loves this project, he loves the Vietnam era. I would like to get more boats. I wanna see things like, for instance, since Vietnam, there's no monitors. There's not a single monitor. I hear there's one in California, it doesn't have engines in it. I haven't found a picture of it, but I want to build a monitor. 
A monitor was they took a boat and put a tank turret on the front of a boat and said, go up that canal and blow up the enemy, and guys did. And she cruised along at four knots. And by cruised along, that's you and I walking somewhere, four knots. And that, that's just awesome, but they're all gone. So I would like to see us get another piece of historical history and continue to preserve it, maybe for rides if it's feasible, or maybe just to be a static display so, that so people can come and be proud. But I think there's nothing sadder than a boat out of water. I cannot wait for this boat to be in the water. It's where all boats belong. When it's done, uh, I hope to be helping you know veterans to, to cope with their everyday lives and get them back to normal living. I think it's probably just, I always liked helping people and in the process, I'm helping myself. A little selfish, I guess. I love it. I think it's wonderful. Um, this is something I never dreamed I would ever see one of these boats again, much less be on one than the riding one. Um, I just can't wait for my family to be able to go out with me and hopefully experience a little bit of what it's like to cruise down a river in one of these things. It's amazing. I spent 26 years in the Navy and just I retired in 1993 as a Navy captain, and so I, I enjoyed it. And if I had to do over again, I probably would.